so one afternoon I was driving uh, and uh, ended up being stopped by a police officer. And the police officer came up to the car and was speaking. And I rolled my window down and I showed and said that I'm deaf. But the police officer kept talking and so I handed my, my license, registration, and insurance card. I don't know if that's what was asked, but that's, you know, that made sense to me. And again, I gestured I'm deaf. Uh, and he kept talking and then just grabbed the documents I gave him and he went back to his car for about 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes, and was still talking. And I didn't understand what, what was going on, what he was saying. And he did gesture like this with his body language for me to get out of the car. So I understood that. And you know, I, I thought it was important to cooperate, so I got out of the car. And he started really being aggressive with me and pushed me against the car, grabbed me. I didn't say anything, I didn't do anything. I just cooperated. No problem, I didn't want any problems. Uh, he grabbed my hands and, uh, and put me in cuffs behind my back. But the law says that that's not permissible. Yeah, a deaf person uses sign language with, where it's against the law to cuff us with our hands behind our back. So he did that anyway and kept talking. I didn't understand what he was saying. And then he pointed again. I understood that. He pointed his finger in that, this direction. So uh, it made sense that he wanted me to walk this way so I walked to the front of the police car and waited and he kept talking when he came back to me and I, I don't know he started getting aggressive again physically aggressive I don't know if he was expecting me to speak but I, I couldn't respond I didn't know what he was talking about and I'm deaf so finally let my let me go from the cuffs and I asked if I you know, I gestured about writing so I could write a note. And I wrote, he gave that to me and I wrote, I'm deaf. And he just, the look on his face though, was that he didn't believe me. And I said, I told you that. And at that moment, for some reason, a sheriff showed up. This was, uh, this person that I was interacting with was uh, a highway patrolman, but a sheriff showed up. And the sheriff was like, what, what's going on here? And he said that he's deaf. And I caught what, uh, what you know, just by reading his lips, that the patrolman said, yeah, I, I don't think he's deaf. But the sheriff said, no, you need to let him go. He, he's deaf. Anyway, he let me go based on the, the word of the sheriff because the sheriff knew me. Um, and it, he let me go, didn't apologize or anything. But, and just to add, you know, he was a short guy. Uh, and I don't know if that was the reason he was that way with me, but um, that, that's one thing that happened to me. Uh, and the second story is I was hanging out with a group of friends and we went to a park just, just to hang out. And I and sat at a picnic table and we were just, talking, conversing. Uh, and then at some point, uh, two uh, sheriffs came up and another police officer showed up separately. And they were gesturing like they were for us to follow them. And we were all deaf, like what's going on? Wait, 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 we're deaf, what, what, what's what's going on? Um, they, but. They insisted, they didn't care. They arrested all of us, put us in cuffs. Uh, and I was saying, you can't do that. Um, you know, at, at, all of us are deaf. It was four of us total. And they put our hands behind our backs anyway. Um, and they didn't do that to me. Uh, they couldn't get my, my hand behind my back, but they put it in front. And I had a, at that time I had a bad knee and I was trying to tell them, wait a minute, no, I'm trying to move. You know, I'm trying to gesture that uh, I, I, my knee is bad, but that that officer didn't care. And they pushed us toward the van. They put us in the van. 
And all of us are still wondering, why are we being arrested? No idea. Nothing was that we understood was said. We ended up being taken to the police station, the county jail, and being held in cells for two hours. Fortunately, a friend, one of the guys, one of my friends who was with us, his aunt worked there as a clerk and she saw his name pop up in their system. So she came down to find out what's going on. What, what's the charge? Why is he arrested? And no one had an answer. So his, my friend's aunt went and found him and asked him what's going on. He had no idea. And so she came back out to ask other officers, what's the charge? We told her that we were just sitting there. We were at a park, we were just chatting, just hanging out, shooting the breeze. And these officers showed up and arrested us. They didn't tell us any charge. They just threw us in a van, in the van and cuffed us. So what ended up happening is that uh, we a lawsuit was filed uh, and those officers were relieved of duty for falsifying information. And, you know, that we told them very specifically that we are deaf, but they didn't care. And, I, you know, I don't know what the difference would be um, other than, you know, we are black and those officers were white and we were deaf. That would be my story. I think it's just this, it's a color thing, you know, and people have an issue with color as it relates to their to skin color. Yeah, and for a lot of people, that's a problem, but you know, as far, for me, you know, we all bleed the same color as a, I think that's the experiences, though, that I've had uh, are because of my skin color. I think that's the point. But, you know, the world is has been created with beautiful colors. So, yeah, that's what I would say. So in the chat, what did what happened here so in the chat if you guys you know describe what you saw what happened what is what is happening in lamont's story if you don't mind just typing in a couple of words in the chat what did you notice what happened see oh my god is the first response absolutely He's being targeted for being a black male. There's ignorance. Not given a chance to explain his disability. Discrimination, hope they're coming fast now. Ignorance, confused about the officer's behavior, injustice. What did happen as a question? Were there charges? So looking larger male as well, absolutely. It's more discrimination, no knowledge of the deaf community, absolutely. Officer are scared, absolutely. No charge offered, bias, assuming he was lying, absolutely. Couple more here. It pisses you off, absolutely. People are ignorant. <clears throat> and Lamont wanted to add that it was about, it's about access as well. It's not just about it's all about access and about the deaf access as well, about the color of his skin, as well as the fact that of his, um, of how he communicates. Thank you, Lamont, for that. I appreciate that. Please, the officer did not believe that he was deaf, as deafness uh, has a race, and then the other um, officers believe they could get away with arresting them because they thought um, they would not be able to speak for themselves, discrimination. Um, uh, everybody is equal in caps. So that's just the beginning of what we're doing today. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit to that. And thank you guys for, um, I see more and more are coming in and, um, and we'll get to, we'll get to um, dissecting scenarios like that as we move forward. Um, again, I appreciate everyone for being here today. 
Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Rob Delalu. I am the Director of Multicultural Affairs, and I'm also in an interim vice president um, uh, leader role um, for SSEM at the, uh, at the time of up until next year. Um, we are proud of what we're doing in the forums and how it's grown. This is already our sixth total forum, um, seven if you included uh, one that we did prior um, last semester. And these forums were designed and developed um, to really talk about social justice and what does that mean for many populations um, in our community and throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, and how individuals identify differently, um, whether that be through race and culture, whether that be through orientation um, and, and others. And so we are, uh, we've designed these forms back in, uh, you know, the, what really triggered us off back in uh, late May and then early June, we, we did our first form um, right after the, the incredible, unfortunate death that we witnessed live um, that was filmed of George Floyd. Um, and we did a, a, a fast action, a, we did a fast action um, meeting where over 200 people joined us to talk about their experiences um, in America. Um, and that really triggered off more of our, um, more of our forms, which we, we spoke about race and, and how it means to criminal justice and policing, race and educational inequity, race and LGBTQ rights, race and women's rights. Um, and it just, and now today it brings us to race. Um, right now it brings us to race, intersectionality of race within our communities of people with disability and also mental health. It is huge that we um, speak about these things because a lot of times they are ignored. Um, and with them being ignored, these forms are an opportunity for us to really speak about it at the ground level and for us to create a pathway in the future to kind of create influence where we can change our little circles and become more and more educated. Um, over 160 people have registered for today's um, uh, event, about 85 of us, 90 of us are in the room right now. Um, but it is great to see that so many people are active and wanting to be part of this, especially when it's a beautiful day outside. And we're taking time to really speak about things that, that truly matter to um, help um, others and to learn about others that are in our communities. Next slide, please. So our, um, our goal is to create these spaces that we will allow for all of us to um, fight as we, and, and also look to uh, create opportunities to hear our voices in, in many different ways. With that, with that said, there are ground rules that we have to um, establish within these spaces. So the first ground rule is understanding that this is a safe space. We all may have different opinions, we have different lenses and different experiences. Today is one of the one of the days that we have so many different intersections of race, culture, identity, ability, mental health, and because of that, there, there's going to be a very we're going to be there's going to be so many different experiences that we need to know that this space is a safe space. What what happens? Uh, so we want you to respect one another. It is a recorded session, so if you don't want um, to be recorded. Um, you can have your camera. If you don't want your face on recording, you can have your camera off. But just understand that this is a recorded session for others to learn in the future and utilize in their spaces as well. Um, with that said, with um, we have in there, we have a chat option um, that you can utilize. We will have a q and I have a panelist that we will provide information for you today. And if you do have a question or comment, we will provide space for you at the end of the um, session for you to um, ask questions to the panelists. And you'll probably have about 35 to 40 minutes to do that. Um, I will, we do, this is, um, today I just would like to give you a heads up that we do have visual access today. Um, so video is um, video remote uh, American Sign Language interpreters and real-time captioning is happening for our deaf, um, through Deaf Service Unlimited um, today. Um, it is suggested that deaf participants pin uh, the active um, interpreter to, um, uh, to meet the individual viewing preferences. So if you are 
um, deaf that you do pin the um, interpreter to your screen. Um, Real-time captions are being uh, displayed um, for, um, for all, but what you need to do is go down to the bottom and it has the closed captioning option. Click on that and it says show um, subtitles and you can click on that so you can get the um, subtitles as well. Uh, we encourage all participants to use um, speaker view to enable um, slides um, and the speaker to, um, to be able to be more visible and have the same screen as we are moving along, okay? If you do have, a, um, if you want to ask a question and you don't feel comfortable doing that out in front of everybody, because there's a lot of people on here, you do have the option to send me a private message. And when you send me the private message, I will be able to then in turn um, ask that question out to the panelists or answer it myself. Um, but you, your um, identity will be will be disclosed. So if you have an opposing view or something that you're, you're you want to expand on, want someone to expand on please send me the information or just even a simple, a simple comment that you would like to make, send it my way. And if it does fit within the structure and the time, I will um, be able to, um, to say that out to the, to the group. Also be respectful, understand if you do go out of the room or back in the room, or if you do ask a question or comment later on, when, once you are done, please um, hit the mute button after so that way we don't get any feedback. And if you are asking several questions, just be, um, you know, uh, you know, play the room and kind of feel the, the, the rhythm of the room because we want to make sure that our, um, everyone gets an opportunity to ask questions and we don't want anyone dominating every question um, or comment if possible. So with that said, we are ready to start our program today. I hope you enjoyed this. This one is a little bit more interactive. There's a ton of videos. There's a lot of, that we have to get through. Um, and again, I appreciate your attendance and Melissa. What is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a way of understanding social relations by examining intersecting forms of discrimination. This means acknowledging that social systems are complicated and that many forms of oppression, like racism, sexism and ageism, might be present and active at the same time in a person's life. Everyday approaches to building equality tend to focus on one type of discrimination, for instance sexism, and then work to address only that specific concern. But while the career of a young, white and able-bodied woman might improve with gender equality protections, an older, black, disabled lesbian may continue to be hampered by racism, ageism, ableism and homophobia in the workplace. Intersectionality is about understanding and addressing all potential roadblocks to an individual or group's well-being. But it's not as simple as just adding up oppressions and addressing each one individually. Racism, sexism and ableism exist on their own. But when combined, they compound and transform the experience of oppression. Intersectionality acknowledges that unique oppressions exist, but is also dedicated to understanding how they change in combination. The roots of intersectionality lie within the black feminist movement, with legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw originating the term. Crenshaw felt that anti-racist and feminist movements were both overlooking the unique challenges faced by black women. She stated that legislation about race is framed to protect black men, and legislation about sexism is understood to protect white women. So simply combining racism and sexism together does not therefore protect black women. Intersectional theory is now applied across a range of social divisions and also to understandings of domination, such as those associated with whiteness, masculinity and heterosexuality. Intersectionality is not only about multiple identities and it's not a simple answer to solving problems around equality and diversity. It is, however, an essential framework as we truly engage with issues around privilege and power and work to bring them into the open. Intersectionality means listening to others, examining our own privileges and asking questions about who may be excluded or adversely affected by our work. As importantly, it means taking measurable action to invite, include and centre the voices and work of marginalised individuals.
So I wanted to play that video to kind of really get us talking about and having an understanding of what intersectionality means and understanding how this really affects many of our students, a lot of uh, students and people in our community. All right. So when looking at it, it's a lot of times we look at things as being very just black and white, and we don't really look at all of the makeup of what, who we are and, and the struggles that we may have. Some things are visible, some things may not be visible to the other. So culture sometimes can be visible, sometimes it can't be. Sometimes the color, uh, color of our skin is visible. Mental, um, sometimes a disability is visible, but sometimes those things are not, right? Mental health cannot be, sometimes it's not visible, right? A ability is not visible. So these, the reason why we wanted to kind of have this conversation today is really kind of speak to this and how does this really affect many of our people of color who are struggling with that, but also really give an opportunity to talk about these things that are happening to us just as a whole. It doesn't necessarily have to be a person who identifies of color, with, you know, but race does play a role within some of the struggles of our students as we had um, spoke about a little bit earlier today and in our, also in our past um, in our past uh, forums. So uh, today, again, I did the welcoming, as you see, today we, are, we showed our video of intersectionality. And then now we're gonna talk about the history of disability rights and our uh, director of the um, Office of Disability Service, um, Julie Joden will be our presenter um, as we start today. And Julie is the current director of disability services um, at the college. She holds a master's in education and deaf education from Boston University and a master's of art in rehabilitation counseling from Assumption College. She has begun teaching as an adjunct in 1997 and offers, uh, cl um, offering classes in deaf studies, American Sign Language, and college uh, success strategies. Um, I'd just like to welcome Julie to our panel. And thank you, Julie. The show is yours. Thank you. I'd like to share a chronological collection of photos and images that really depict some of the key elements of the history of disability rights and begin to show this longstanding intersectionality. Here we see Queen Vispala. She's referenced as the ancient Indian text states as a queen and warrior princess back in the 12th century BCE. She is said to have lost her leg in battle and was given an iron leg by the gods. This is truly the first reference to disability in history and the first reference to a prosthetic device as well. Aristotle and other Greek philosophers in the fourth century BCE viewed the deaf as senseless and incapable of reason. Their perspective remains in many cultures today across our globe where people are still discriminated against based on their ability to hear and or speak articulately. And this form of discrimination is called autism. During the Middle Ages, the disabled were typically cared for in monasteries and convents. Many believed that a disability was caused by the mother's sin or fault, perhaps a family curse or demonic possession. Some cultures still hold this belief today. In the 1700s, People with disabilities tended to live in hospitals, institutions, or asylums. In 1793, Philippe Pignel ushered humanism into the treatment of individuals with mental illness by ordering all chains removed from the men and women who lived in asylums in Paris, France, as depicted in this painting. As we move to the United States, almost 200,000 black men served in the Union Army and Navy and by the close of the Civil War in 1865, many were disabled and struggled to find a productive and equal place in our society. By 1907, involuntary sterilization became legalized in the United States. Over 63,000 individuals labeled mentally defective were sterilized without consent. This included those who were considered, quote, feeble-minded, imbeciles, and idiots. The last case of involuntary sterilization was performed in Oregon in 1981. This slide depicts anti-disability Nazi propaganda, which painted the disabled as a burden on society and quote, useless eaters. In addition to the millions of Jews that were annihilated during the Holocaust, 
it is estimated that over 275,000 people with disabilities were murdered through Nazi eugenic programs. This targeted those with diseases considered hereditary such as mental illness, learning disabilities, physical deformities, epilepsy, blindness, deafness, and alcoholism in order to create a more perfect race. In 1963, President Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health Act, which intended to fund 1,500 mental health facilities that would support community-based recovery during deinstitutionalization. It was never fully funded. And today, the three largest mental health providers in our nation are jails, which disproportionately house black prisoners compared to the US general population. Martin Luther King Jr. seen here shaking hands with President Lyndon B. Johnson, who signed both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1968, both landmark civil rights and labor laws forbidding discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. These civil rights acts paved the way for revolutionary progress and protection for people of color, women, the disabled, and members of the LGBTQIA community. Judith Human and Bradley Lomax are key civil rights advocates seen here rallying for the passage of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This act prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs with federal funding. Section 504 of the Rehab Act protects people with disabilities from discrimination in areas such as education and employment. However, after its passage, the Rehab Act was not immediately implemented. In 1977, there was a 26 day sit-in in San Francisco that may not have been successful without the support of the Black Panthers. For years after its passage, regulations were finally signed that fully implemented protections for the disability outlined in the Rehab Act. And then the Office of Civil Rights can developed its corresponding federal regulations that are now interpreted and followed today. In the 1970s, we saw a formative time for the disability community. This is epitomized in the Netflix documentary Crip Camp. Young people with disabilities that attended this summer camp in the Catskills through the 50s and into the 1970s were unwelcomed at other mainstream summer camps. Many of them, including Judy Human, became leaders in the civil rights movement. This film humanizes their experience and shows how this camp fostered a sense of community that fed the disability rights movement. The deinstitutionalization movement addressed the needs of not only those with mental health disabilities, but also has been applied to the needs of individual with developmental disabilities as well. These pictures, although graphic to see, illustrate the living conditions at Willowbrook State Developmental Center in New York, which did not officially close until 1987 after 20 years of expose. These photos epitomize the inhumane and unethical treatment and living conditions of children and adults with developmental disabilities at Willowbrook. Eventually, through parent advocacy and litigation, Willowbrook was closed and today community-based placements and services for individuals with developmental disabilities are now encouraged. In 1988, the deaf community united to witness the Deaf President Now movement where a group of deaf students at Gallaudet University, a deaf college in Washington, DC, demanded that their next college president be deaf like them. They closed down the college, held sit-ins, protested in the streets and gained support from local minoritized groups until their demands were met and I King Jordan became the first deaf president of Gallaudet. In this photo, you see individuals with various disabilities crawling out of their wheelchairs and mobility devices and pulling themselves up the steps of our nation's Capitol building. Their actions illustrated the indignity and obstacles faced every day by individuals with disabilities due to rampant inaccessibility, 
and the intentional delay of the civil rights legislation. But four months after the Capitol crawl, the Americans with Disabilities Act was finally signed by President Bush, just 30 years ago. Accommodating people with disabilities in the workplace, in education, and in public was no longer just the right or nice thing to do. It was the law. The ADA gives people with disabilities the civil right to equal access, much like the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968 did for people of color. Unfortunately, not only is the ADA an unfunded mandate, but the definition of who qualifies as having a disability became so conservatively defined that the ADA had to be amended in 2008 to broaden the legal definition and provide further protections against discrimination to those that have or are perceived to have a disability. Every year, there's a World's Mental Health Day on October 10th. We promote open discussion of mental disorders and the investment needed for prevention and treatment. In 2012, this woman's image was captured at World Mental Health Day rally in India, demanding the stop of electric shock treatment for patients. This year, on World's Mental Health Day, we called for an international increase in investment and funding for mental health services, especially given the impact of the COVID pandemic on our global well being. And lastly, here in 2020, protests continue in Manhattan, New York for equal access to elevators for all. These demands escalated after the death of an African-American mother who died falling down a flight of stairs in the subway while carrying her baby in a stroller. Less than 20% of New York subway stations are accessible, limiting public transportation access for individuals with mobility challenges and violating their civil rights. You can see here people of different abilities and different identities demanding universal design and access for all. Clearly, we are still making history and are in the midst of the disability rights movement. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. That was extremely um, powerful and thanks for the history there. Um, I have a question for you to kind of really get this, you know, the panel moving here. And uh, the first question I have for you is um, many of the images of you shown display individuals using wheelchairs um, with physical disabilities. Can you describe for us the range of disabilities that individuals may have? Absolutely. The wheelchair itself has really become an unofficial international symbol for disability. And of course it's a visible disability. It can represent many people with um, hearing loss as well, vision loss or other physical disabilities but many people that have disabilities also have invisible or hidden disabilities, as you've mentioned earlier, Rob. And this can impact their mental health, their learning, their cognition, their processing. The ADA, in fact, defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And we work here at Bristol with a range of students who might have um, more than one disability, which is another level of intersectionality where many individuals have multiple disabilities that may impact their life at different times. Thank you so much for that. We're gonna move on to the next panel. Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, so I'm gonna introduce to you guys, Sarah Medeiros. Uh, Sarah Medeiros is a graduate of Johnson Wheels University with a doctorate in education and leadership. She has 10 plus years of experience working in special education, mostly in urban settings. Um, her research and um, interests include educational equity and the areas of race, disability, and special education. So uh, welcome, Sarah. Um, I have, my question to you is this. Um, in what ways does racism affect disability identification in our schools? Um, Thank you, Rob. So um, one thing that I'm, I'm actually glad that she covered the history because that was something I was going to go over. And it's a very long history. Um, and I say long, but it really hasn't been that long. If you look at the history of um, educational equity for kids with disabilities um, in schools, um, they really were only afforded the, the right to a free and appropriate education um, in the 70s, which it really is not that long ago. So you know, if we look at our country when it was founded in 1776, 
it took all this time for us to have this, um, you know, this, this right to educate kids with disabilities. Before then, they, um, you know, schools had the right to turn away any kids. Um, and most often, those kids who would get turned away were the kids who were poor, black, or a person of color. Um, so something that a lot of people don't realize is that, um, and I didn't even realize until I got my master's in special education was that disabilities are often identified in schools. So when I say identified, this doesn't mean that they have an official, um, you know, medical diagnosis or anything like that, but there are things that are referred to, like, like she had mentioned, um, invisible disabilities, or that's sometimes called high incidence disabilities that, um, that you they don't they don't have any biological um factors to them so you can't go to a to a doctor and get a test and find out if you have this disability or you can't um you know it's not like a physical disability so disabilities like um emotional disturbance or behavioral disability um intellectual disabilities um uh autism um and there there are several and more but um until the, like 1997, where um, in schools, they started to, um, you started to see more IEPs, which are individual education plans. And when this started to happen, this is when the disability identification started to happen more in our schools. And when I say identification, I mean that um, a team of multidisciplinary professionals come together and they evaluate students using, um, you know, standardized testing, formal and formal observations, and um, a team gets together and decides whether or not this child has a disability. And if this child doesn't have a disability, do they need an individual education plan in order to be successful in school? And that plan will give them access to um, special education services. So um, saying all that, I know that was, that was a mouthful, but um, ever since the 70s, every single year, um, um, Congress receives a report um, on how the IDA, which is the Individual Disabilities Education Act, is being implemented, and they report on racial data. Um, every single year for the last 40-something years, um, Black children have been overrepresented in special education. Um, not just Black children, it's been Hispanic children um, and Native American children as well. But black children uh, across the board have been overrepresented in these high incidence disabilities. Now, keep in mind, um, education is mostly white. Um, our school age children, the, the demographics are changing. So we're seeing more diversity among school age children, um, but we're not seeing a lot of diversity in our school staff. So um, right now, I believe the number is 84%. Um, 84% of our teachers and our school staff are white. So um, white and mostly white women. So white women ultimately start to become the gatekeepers and the judges of um, whether or not these children have disabilities. Um, again, when, I, when we say racism in education, this is not to say that anybody has malice or ill intent when they refer a child um, for an evaluation for special education services. It's often done with um, good intent because they, they see a student who's struggling and think, hey, that child might have a learning disability. Um, but the problem with that is that um, it comes this obsession with labels, right? Um, this is, uh, I'm sorry, obsession with this line, this ability line of like, um, of, of special in general, of ability and disability. And basically in, in education, what's viewed as disability is the absence of normal. So when you have majority white women judging a, a pool of children who are look different and might come from a different culture of their own, that's when you begin to see the problem. So um, representation has been happening for years and years and years. And um, every, like literally every single year, there has not been one year that there hasn't been an overrepresentation. Um, and this is not to say that these all of these children are being mislabeled. Um, but I liked what Lamont said about, it wasn't about a disability, it was about accessibility. Um, we have to stop and think, why, why is it that these kids keep getting labeled as having disabilities? Because there's a clear overrepresentation, right? Um, 
their why it's because they're not doing well in school they're having behavioral issues um mental health issues because a lot of students get put on IEPs for those things as well um and you know we, we create this obsession with labeling things and, and evaluating kids and putting them on these educational plans and thinking okay this is what they need this is what they need instead of giving them what they what they actually need which is educate them in the way that they can learn right um so so yeah there, there becomes this this um you know notion of almost creating disabilities among our students and it happens most often to black children and um i'm sure this is going to be talked about as well but um the the four most the four highest um overrepresented disabilities for black children are emotional disturbance behavioral disabilities um intellectual disabilities which a lot of people um there, there's a lot of a lot of um I, I recommended a book in one of the resources i provided it's called the mismeasure of man um the the whole notion of iq and intellectual disabilities it's it's rooted in eugenics right so um uh julie had touched upon um how the most recent one was in the, the most recent um sterilization was in the 1980s so this is this is still very fresh and again this is still this is still happening like the things that we you know we hear about the history of special education and the horrible things that happen it might not be happening so overtly in our faces but um children uh, children of color um black children are still facing a lot of inequities and again um when we talk about equity and justice in education right now i feel like there's like this big movement of like we need justice in education um you know and I and I and I totally am for that, like for poor communities and um, but disability is often left out of that conversation. And people think that because there's legislation that protects people with disabilities that oh they're good. They have the IDA, they're good. Um, the problem with that is those things, first of all, are not always followed through. Um, second of all, uh, when you have to have a, a legislation in, in place to uh, give people the right to an education and give people the right to um, not experience certain inequities in education, um, those things can be also taken away, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I recently read a book called Care Work, and she talks a lot about this notion of community care. And, um, you know, I think so. A lot of legislation that's happening now, so the IDA um, has been reauthorized several times to kind of include this. Um, you know, it's so focused on numbers, like the overrepresentation issue. We have to focus on getting those numbers down. We have to have less kids being identified, uh, black kids being identified in special education. But that's not necessarily the problem. The problem is that they're not getting what they need. So they're being referred to special education, right? So it's not it's not a, it's not a matter of numbers, and we need to have less kids identified. It's a matter of let's figure out who are the let's figure out the proper identification and make sure that they truly have a disability, and um, labeling them and, and finding out if they have a disability really doesn't matter, to be honest. Um, I mean, I'm saying like learning disabilities, those invisible disabilities, like um, the high incidence ones. Um, what matters is are they getting what they need, right? Um, I recently had a conversation with a colleague who we were talking about a student and she was telling me how uh, I think he has a reading disability and, and you know, we're in the middle of COVID right now. So, you know, gi giving assessments right now is not the easiest thing, right? And I, and I said, you know, what matters is, 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 are you instructing that kid in the way that he needs? And if you are, the label doesn't really matter anymore, right? So, and, the, and I, I know I'm talking a lot right now, but the problem with that obsession with labels is that once that black student or student of color receives that label, they're more likely to be segregated in their schools, within their schools. So, you know, people think that school segregation, oh, like kids with special needs are not no longer segregated, but they are. There's, there's substantially separate classrooms and I actually teach one and I love what I do, um, but that those classes are reserved for students who are, whose disabilities are so severe that they need to be separated from the general population. Um, black students are the most likely to be placed in those programs. They're the most likely to, um, black disabled people um, are the most likely to have um, 
who, who receive that, that um, identification in schools are most likely to go on and be unemployed, not access call, um, uh, college or higher education. Um, there, there's a lot of inequities that are, that are um, associated with that label. And I think Julie had mentioned also like, like the, the kind of the school to prison pipeline type thing. Like, you know, um, if you look at um, the amount of kids in school, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not kids, adults in prisons who are reading at a third grade level. I recently read a piece of research that said like, I think it was like almost 70% of um, people in Texas prisons were reading at a grade three, four level. Um, and you, we all know that the majority of those prisoners are black or people of color. Um, so it's all connected and it's, you know, like we're talking about intersectionality. Um, I think that when we, we need to start, and I'm so glad that you put on this forum because um, ableism is a thing. And when we don't have, when we are just perpetuating this ableist culture of like, well, he's normal and he's not, and I'm just gonna teach to this one kid because he fits in this box. We don't have that community care. And when you don't have that community care, you only are um, you know, educating or including a certain amount of people and you're excluding people and people forget it's very easy. You know, everyone at some point will experience disability and, and one day it might be you or a loved one and, and you will realize how hard it is to like, you know, we, we forget able-bodied and neurotypical people forget and not forget, we, 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 because we are so privileged, we don't realize how hard it is to access things. And so that, that's kind of like, um, that was like the basis of my research also was like the overrepresentation of black students in special ed. Um, this is something I'm very, very, very passionate about. Um, and again, it's not to like undermine kids with disabilities because there are black kids with disabilities. And I do think that, you know, sometimes it is important to have that identification if they need to have a certain service or something. But I think at the end of the day, we forget that it's all about community care and just giving kids what they need rather than placing that label on them. That can be very harmful. Absolutely, and thank you for that, uh, Sarah. And we'll come back to you because there's a lot of other uh, questions that I'd like to, to ask. And um, so um, our next uh, presenter or our next panelist is Lamont. Um, Lamont is deaf, um, so if you go to his uh, profile, which is Big Monster Math. If you click on it on the top right corner, there's those three dots, you click on that and you can pin the video so you can see him sign, but the interpreters will speak in um, for him as well. And there will be captioning for his um, section and, and segment. So Lamont, um, thanks for being here. Um, the video that we, that we worked on and, and sat through was um, amazing, but, and we love hearing about your um, experience. And um, so I'm gonna go over Lamont's uh, bio and then I'm gonna ask him a quick question. So Lamont is uh, currently an education um, student here at Bristol Community College. Uh, Lamont identifies as African-American and a deaf man. Uh, currently Lamont um, works as a grill master at a local restaurant. So if you guys want some good food, go find Lamont and he, he, he I'm pretty sure he throws down. Um, <laughs> But Lamont, um, again, thank you for the video and, and a lot of the, you know, you did make a mention about access. Um, so could you, you know, ex talk to us about what does that mean for you of being a deaf man and navigating through your education um, as, a, as a deaf man first and maybe as a black man second? And we're gonna switch interpreters. One moment, please. Okay, we're ready. Because, like you. So, do you want me to? Do you want me to explain what I went through, or do you want me to say a little bit about disability and and the ADA? Because I think that the ADA really is very clear. And it's sad that some of the police officers out there aren't aware of some of these laws and how they're covered and that they make bad decisions based on this ignorance. I 
know that there are people out there who act like they're disabled or try to put one over on you, but, um, and, and they have a right to defend themselves. I get that part, um, but we're not all like that. And to be disabled and then be seen as a person of color. And then on top of that, I'm a big man. Um, you know, it kind of worked against me in those situations. But, you know, as I go through life and I have experiences and I know life is not easy, it's frustrating. And, you know, I've been through a lot, I admit that. Um, but still, I am alive and I'm here to tell the story. Absolutely. Yes, you are. And uh also, there are, you know, the things that some people with disabilities needs and me and the frustrations that we go through daily just to get basic needs met. I mean, to have opportunities for access. Yes, of course. You know, we want those things. And today with the technology that's out there, you know, that they ought, they even those businesses who create these technologies forget that there's a disabled community out there. You know, they go so far down the road and then somebody says, wait a minute, come back. We forgot about the blind community or the deaf community or whatever community that now does not have access to those technologies. So um, I don't know. What more can I say? Yeah, no. And I think really it's your, your second half. I mean, you explained great. Um, earlier about your experiences. So how does that access look? How do you navigate um, access within your education? Um, things that may, um, or just in life, what are some, some tips or opportunities you can, you can, or things you can really tell the audience about that is, that you face that are- Okay, well, the challenges I would have to start with some of the challenges that I face. Mm -hmm. The number one, obviously for me is communication access. That's the toughest for me. I mean, I wouldn't say it's, you know, that hard sometimes, sometimes, you know, I just have to write in a notebook or, you know, sometimes I can use my phone, I can make do, but I have to always find a way to communicate with somebody who can hear, or I have to gesture in some way. Or, you know, I could write in dirt on the ground if I had to with a stick, you know what I mean? But I have to somehow figure out if I need something now, how am I going to communicate with this person, this person who can hear, who's not like me. And sometimes the person I'm trying to communicate with, I feel like they're judging me. Um, and I'm just trying to find a way to adapt so that I can get them to not judge me and, and kind of get my needs met in that way. So I would say that's, you know, that's a challenge for me. I would say another challenge for myself or any deaf person would be um, like you want to order something. You just want to go to McDonald's. You want to go to a fast food restaurant, but it's not that easy. They'll say, you know, go away or I'm not going to write back and forth with you or you try to pull up, you know. You know, I just want to write down my order so that you can see what I want to order. And, you know, some of them are really nice and they take the, you know, they take the paper that I've written on. Some of them won't take it. Some of them there's a problem or, or if I have to go to the emergency room, let's say. That's actually been some of my most frustrating moments. And now I have to wear a mask. And there's people behind masks talking to me now and I can't hear them. And I'm also not able to read their lips as well. And, um, you know, if you put their, you know, what am I supposed to do? Put my hand on their neck to like vibe so I can, you know, vibrationally feel what they're trying to say to me. It's very difficult in these COVID times. And um, it doesn't, you know, whatever. I require an interpreter or I require, you know, an access in some way and that's a problem. Or if I have to go to court, that's actually worse, I think. If you if you need if you're in a legal situation and you have to go to court, I need someone to go and represent me. I can write back and forth, but and it doesn't matter who these people are in that room that are talking about me. I, I can say, what are they saying? What are they saying? And they'll just be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And they might tell me summarize what they're saying, but I won't get word for word what's going on. And I'm pretty sure I wouldn't understand maybe what was going on throughout that day. So there are 
places I find myself where communication is still hard and I'm still, you know, learning how to navigate those places. And, you know, that's just an ongoing thing, but I'm still fine. That's what I always like to say. I'm still fine. Everything's good. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, I really appreciate that, Lamont, and we'll come back to you as well. Thank you so, so much. Um, we're going to move on to the next piece of this. So we're, again, we're looking at intersectionality here and uh, we're going to play a quick video and then we're going to introduce our second half of panelists. Uh, so just bear with us. Um, it's a quick three minute, uh, four minute video that we're about to show. It's hard enough to get mental health treatment in the U.S., but it's even harder if you're not white. Studies show that racial and ethnic minorities are significantly less likely to receive mental health treatment than whites. So we reached out to experts to find out why it's so hard for people of color to get help. The first thing is stigma. In other words, shame or disgrace that can make people feel excluded. Stigma is a big deal in the U.S., but especially in communities of color. The Asian American community has uh, high amounts of depression, anxiety, and other mental illnesses, just like every other community. Even when uh, people might uh, uh, get connected to a healthcare provider, uh, often the family doesn't understand. They feel like uh, if it's known that their child uh, is uh, seeking uh, help, that, that uh, the family will uh, be uh, 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 looked down upon. Your cultural value, your cultural circle does not afford you the possibility of asking for help. Not being able to even verbalize that piece then leads people to very dark corners and very dark places. Depression, in untreated depression in those cases oftentimes leads to suicidal ideation or drinking or substance use of some sort. The second reason is a lack of cultural competence. Cultural competence is a doctor's ability to recognize the different places their patients are coming from and then be able to adapt to their needs. Traditionally, African Americans will not come in and say, I'm depressed. They'll say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Fatigue is a real clear sign. So they'll not really even appreciate themselves that what they're experiencing is a mental disorder because that's considered frailty. And frailty is something that's not really considered acceptable in a community that consists of most, mostly working people. A person uh, might be uh, considered uh, psychotic if they have, if they say they believe in ghosts, but this is a cultural belief. Sometimes it can rise to the level of a delusion, but, but sometimes uh, it just has to be taken into account. Not being sensitive to culture can lead to a wrong diagnosis, and that's happened and it's led to a legacy of distrust. That distrust has included outright racism. During times of slavery, African Americans, particularly African American women, were experimented upon in terms of um, OBGYN surgeries, and there's clear history of that. They were also um, subjected to um, an experiment um, called the Tuskegee Experiment. We're talking about a federally funded 40-year syphilis experiment that turned people into human lab rats without their knowledge. And by the way, that experiment didn't end until 1972. And for people who don't speak English, finding a therapist who speaks your language isn't easy. On a national scale, the lack of, of uh, mental health providers that speak other languages is large. Think about the areas of conflict right now, the Middle East. There's a lot of people coming from Syria who speaks Arabic fluently. When you think about people migrating from Africa, people from Ethiopia or Eritrea that are coming to the United States, there's, I don't know how many languages in India, not everybody speaks Hindi. Finally, there's a lack of providers and few mental health care providers of color, which could go a long way into tackling all the issues we just discussed. And while the Affordable Care Act has helped a lot of people gain access to treatment, who's filling all that demand? And if people have to wait for hours in line just to get treatment, which patients will fall through the cracks? When it comes to mental health in the US, there's a lot of talk and little action. 
So um, there's a, just a quick to kind of really catapult our next um, part of our discussion. Um, we really want to kind of focus now for the next uh, few minutes here on uh, mental health and race and the intersectionality of mental health and race. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Kenton Kirby. Um, and Kenton uh, completed a master's degree in social work uh, from New York University. With up to 20 years of experience in the field, Mr. Kirby has worked in several positions in child welfare, as well as forensic, um, forensic uh, social work uh, throughout the New York State court system. Uh, in his current role as director of, of practice at the Center for Court Innovation, Kenan is responsible for spearheading direct practice values and vision for one of the largest agencies in New York City. Kenton um, was also one of the founders in developing the Make It Happen program at the Center for uh, Court Innovation. Uh, Make It Happen is a, a revolutionary and nationally recognized program uh, model that provides mentoring, intensive case management, clinical interventions and supportive workshops to young men of color ages 16, 24, who have been impacted by violence. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce Ken and Kirby. Welcome, Ken. Hey, what's going on, Rob? Good to see you, man. Good to see you as well. And my question for you um, is this. <clears throat> so in, what are some of the ways uh, the mental health system has been oppressive to Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, so nice to see a lot of faces here. Um, so the, the video actually kind of started sh framing it, right? Um, but how it plays in practice in my day-to-day, -day, how I've seen over the course of my career, is um, there's a fear of um, Black and Brown expressiveness, right? How um, the mental health system has been rooted in whiteness. The foundation of it is that, right? Um, I think of the earliest days and I think of uh, Freud and how he viewed um, the therapist client patient relationship. The therapist is a blank slate and uh, uh, the client is supposed to um, just unload on this blank slate. Um, that's actually interesting, great, great, great way to kind of set it off, but it's not, responsive to the individuality and how of, of, of people, right? We've been, the mental health system has tried to operationalize working with human beings, working with people in crises. You can't do that, right? Um, people are imperfect. We have one, long, one arm is longer than the other, one foot is bigger than the other. You can't operationalize it, you really can't. But the system and our field, because of you know kind of white supremacy and you know the patriarchy, everything that we we've been talking about here, has been taking this round peg and trying to fit into square square circle, right? This round peg, square peg into a round circle, um, and that's been happening, and and it's been at the expense of people of color. That's why you have in schools some high rates. Someone mentioned that high rates of kids diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, um, ADHD, you have more, so many black and brown kids labeled with those things. And we also understand that when you write something down as a, as a professional, it follows our young people throughout their lives, especially our young folks that are connected to systems, right? Specifically our poor black and brown um, and indigenous folks that are connected to these systems just because of where they, their station is in this in this structure, right? Um, so I'm labeled oppositional defined as a kid. I now have IEP. I have to go see a, 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 a counselor at the school. I act out a little bit. Now that's going to follow me. Go to the next school, same thing. Now I go from being the student with oppositional defined. Now I'm 18, 19 years old. I got upset, something happened. Now I'm a defendant. And then something happens, and now I'm in the system. And someone mentioned earlier, I think Julie mentioned earlier, that the, the jail system has come, almost become the biggest mental health provider in this country. But the majority of people in that mental health, in that, let's, let's call it a hospital, this long, like mental health facility, which is the criminal justice system, are predominantly black and, and, uh, and not white, right? So there's a huge disconnect there, huge disconnect. And no one has actually until recently have decided to reckon, reckon that. So I look at things like um, the, uh, criminal justice reform movements around kind of closing. Um, in New York City, we closed, we're closing, we're, we're talking about closing Rikers Island, which is a notorious prison. Um, we're thinking, we're talking about really revamping what it, the criminal justice system across the country. And black and brown folks have been 
targeted because of because of this, right? Um, we use models and intervention in the in our in our in these communities that we call evidence based, and they've never been tested and evaluated in these communities. So once again, you're taking a, a square peg and putting it into a round hole because you know what? It's not about helping uh, communities of color thrive. It's about keeping them under control. So we use the mental health system as a way to say, oh, we're helping folks thrive. And I'll tell you this, this is why I believe that it's not about thriving. Mental health for black folks, black and um, people of color is not like for thriving, unlike white folks, because if I'm white and I have access and everything like that, I can go on psychology today, my relationship, and I can find a therapist, I can shop around and do all that, what I want to do. If I'm a kid of color, if I'm a kid of person of color living in these communities, my treatment, my mental health care is tethered to some kind of punishment. If I don't do it, you're going to have to go do this. If you don't do this program and talk to this therapist and expose yourself, then you have to, then if you don't do that, then you got a consequence, whether it's probation, whether it's incarceration or whatever. Right? So then how do we trust this intervention? How do I, and then if you go to some of these places, the places are not really set for me to expose myself. Here in New York City, we have projects where we are working with folks and we're literally expecting you to unload your trauma in front of someone who honestly may not be as qualified because usually those are entry level jobs, your first job or two out of college or whatever, your grad program. And now I'm sitting in this room that has no privacy with us, 20 other people having the same conversation. I'm expecting this person un, to, to expose themselves and be vulnerable, right? In the system, in, in, a, in a mandated project. But then if I'm not doing it, then I'm labeled as opposition. Oh, he's, the, he's, he's not complying. He or she's not complying with uh, the services. So it's really, really sad in how we look at um, how mental health has been delivered to the communities of color because and that's why we don't trust it. That's why, and I feel like a lot of folks go, well, you know, it's cultural. That's why these things aren't, um, black folks don't typically go and get mental health treatment. Possibly, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll sit with that. But it's also how the, how, the thing was, how the thing is presented to us. We can't trust it. Historically, we can't trust it. So I know in my work in Brooklyn, we were really focusing on how do we make this something that can be like digested by folks that um, typically won't trust the system. So. We had to come in with a reckoning, like, yo, listen, you know what? You're absolutely right. I'm a black therapist, but I represent this system that has been caused you so much harm. Now I have to prove to you that I'm here for you. And it's more work, but as service providers, if we're providing mental health work, we're in school settings, we and we're trying to really kind of tackle providing quality services while also dealing with this current reckoning that we're that we're dealing with right now when it comes to race, we have to come with humility to our communities. We have to lead with, you know what, historically I get it, but we're trying to do something, we're, we're, I'm, I'm here. And fighting kind of the traditional um, Western view of mental health services. Why are evidence-based models implemented? In, why are we saying, what's the, what's the gold standard for a particular intervention, right? And no one ever questions it. No one goes, oh, this is evidence-based. But no one takes a second step and goes, how big was that sample size of that that evaluation and make it something that is based on evidence. And now we're going to use it in Brooklyn. Something that was tried out in Missouri, rural Missouri, and this actually happened in New York. It called the Missouri model. Practice in Missouri, worked in Missouri, rural Missouri, and then we try to use it in New York City. Same model in New York City. New York City is significantly different than rural Missouri. We have access to subways. We have access to all types of things. And it's New York City, which is the greatest city in the world. But you know what? I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but honestly, in short, uh, it's really about kind of taking, like, acknowledging the history. And as clinicians, mental health providers, challenging how we've been trained and being a little more, more collaborative with how, with the folks that we have the honor to work for. And I say work for, not with, because if they were not, if our folks weren't here for us, we would not have jobs. I'd be working on my mixtape or trying to, trying to pursue my basketball career, Jet Rob. So that's it for me at this point. Thank you for that. It was, uh, I love hearing about this stuff and it's so insightful from all of our panelists. Our last panelist that I'd like to introduce to you is Monique Onoha. And um, Monique is a, a, an alumna of Bristol Community College 
where she uh, graduated with an associate's degree in general studies. Uh, during her time at Bristol, uh, Monique was the president of the Black Student Union, member of the women's basketball team, uh, and a recipient of the Bronze and Silver Shield Awards. Uh, Monique is a former employee of Bristol, um, Bristol's Multicultural Student Center and was a current member of, is, is a current member of Bristol Community College Alumni Association. Uh, presently, Monique is working towards her bachelor's degree in psychology at Bridgewater State University, and Monique can be found doing um, work as a community activist. So welcome, Monique. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, I have a, you know, our question that I have for you is, you know, tell me about your experience balancing uh, being a, a woman of color who battles with depression while balancing school and life. Hi. Um, so, to start to start off with that question, I just I want to give you guys a brief like synopsis of my like high school and going into college real quick. So when I was seventeen, I was kind of forced to you know move out on my own. Um, it was my senior year. I was working three jobs. Um, the high school I went to was a vocational school, so it was predominantly white. Um, I experienced a few different things being a student in a predominantly white school. Um, so being a female of color, my body type's different than most of the students I went there with. So I got in trouble for wearing ripped jeans while other girls are walking around with booty shorts on. Um, be, um, I was in co-op, so my grades were super important in order to keep that job. And I needed to keep that job in order to pay my rent. So I had a teacher who would purposely try to fail me despite knowing my story. And I would go as so far to um, get help after school and they would help me, give me the answers. And she still wouldn't budge to the point where, you know, I had to go to higher up. And um, so those are some of the racial experiences I faced being a black female just in my senior year of high school. Um, as I got into college, I was still working three jobs and I wasn't really involved on campus at first. So um, my grades were up and down. I began to drink a lot um, and I was surrounding myself by the wrong people. I, because I didn't realize that I was suffering from depression. I knew something was wrong. Um, it wasn't until I stopped going to classes for about like a week or two straight and I just couldn't get out of bed that I realized something was wrong. And because I previously knew Rob from my high school and he had come up to me um, once before at BCC, um, he introduced me to the Multicultural Center and um, we connected to the point where I felt comfortable enough reaching out to him. And I kind of broke down and he helped me get the help I needed. Sorry, I get a little emotional. <laughs> um, so de dealing with that was really tough. Um, Eventually, you know, I learned different ways to cope. Um, a lot of what helped me was getting involved on campus. So I try to, you know, promote BCC and getting involved because it's so important because you build these relationships with people. And um, once you have those relationships in any aspect of needing help, you know the right people to get that help from, whether it's with your schoolwork, financial aid, because I know financial aid for the majority of people who are in circumstances like me is the biggest headache in the world and it prevents a lot of people of color from even attending college. Um, but um, yeah, BCC just made me feel at home. The Multicultural Center made me feel at home and it just, even though I was still like you can never get rid of depression and anxiety, but you learn ways to deal with it and embrace it and just make it better. And BCC and the Multicultural Center helped me do that. Now, I wanna have a little follow-up um, to yours before I open it up for the audience. Um, can you speak a little bit to how mental health has affected you in personal relationships with others? Um, and then, you know, you have some unique stories about um, former students who um, mental health has really taken, has, has endured where they has taken their lives. Could you explain a little bit to how that how that affects everyone and, and including yourself? Yeah. So, um, specifically speaking, I have a friend, Kiana DeBarros. She was my 
friends since middle school, my first friend moving to a different school. Um, we were basically family. And, you know, I always knew that she had um, suffered from depression and anxiety. And then on top of it, she had a baby and it, she ended up with postpartum. And um, at the time I thought she was doing better, but I'm a psychology major. So as I learned after the fact, I realized that there are certain signs where people seem like they're doing better when really that is the biggest sign is that they're not doing better. Um, so unfortunately I wasn't educated on that yet. And she had um, committed suicide um, and it was really hard because I know how it feels to feel alone, even though you're not alone, you know that there's people there for you, but like mentally, physically, you just, you don't feel it. And there's no way to explain it in words. Um, and it, for me, it took a big toll on me because, because I knew how she felt. I felt like I wasn't a good enough friend to her. Sorry. <laughs> but as I learned, you know, I started going to counseling and getting help for that, whatever. It did affect my schooling a little bit. I um, took a semester off then I went back part-time, but I've learned so much from it and her death made me appreciate my life so much. No, thank you, Mo. Um, but you know, your, your willingness to, to, to talk your truth is, is extremely powerful and that really opens up to many people who are out there to see that because you know I've been in situations that I have people that have dealt with things very similar to Kiana and you know being able to cope with it to speak your truth for you to be able to stand here and have this conversation with us um, we're really looking again when we're saying influencing circles um, there might be people here on this call um, there may be people that they know that we can share your stories and everyone else is here um, to really, you know, help our community and, and drive us to an area where um, someone who needs to hear it may, you know, so thank you again for, for, for stepping up and, and sharing that. Um, so I, as you can see with our panelists today, this, I mean, it's heavy, powerful, powerful things that we're, we're speaking on and there's no way and then in a short two hour span that we're going to be able to really dive into everything. And I'll explain a little later on how we will start, you know, sectioning these um, topics and really having creating workshops and, and opportunities for people who attend these um, forums. Um, but I wanted to kind of open it up, you know, for um, the last half here to our audience and questions and that they may have questions or comments. I see that our chat has been extremely busy, um, which is great. I love the feedback. I love the energy. Um, I love the strength of what's happening on our panelists. I love the strength that's happening within our, um, that's happening within our chat room here. So um, I like to open it up. Any questions that anyone has, please put in question or comment if you so choose, if you would like to send me a private message. Um, do that as well, and we can begin that piece going. Rob, can I point something out really quick? Absolutely. Um, when Kenton was talking, I I was making so many like connections to like education, and I I think that a lot of it is connected to. Um, so I didn't. I don't think I mentioned this when I was speaking, but uh, the overwrap that we see in special education is the majority of it is male. Um, and I think that that points to, um, you know, th this idea of, um, these negative stereotypes that are associated with black masculinity. Um, you know, when you have a majority, uh, like a majority white, um, staff school, which is almost all of our schools, right. Um, there, there's a lot of negative stereotypes surrounding what a black male is supposed to be and, and what, a, what a boy is supposed to be like. So there's this like idea of like, what is good and what is bad. Um, so when he was, when he was talking about, um, you know, just, just how, you know, things being evidence-based and, and that, that happens in education as well. Like we hear of all these different practices and even, even the system of, of um, the identification system, identifying and placing a label and giving them services, that's all like rooted in whiteness. 
um, and culture is not considered there. Like, um, you know, there's no, there's no system in place that says, hey, let's take a step back and consider this child's culture. Like for example, in a lot of Asian cultures, you are not supposed to look up an adult in the eye, but that's a sign, that's a sign of autism. So a lot of um, um, Asian kids are actually overrepresented in um, the autism category. And other things like, you know, um, just just different cultural things in, that are not considered when, when identification happens. So when he was speaking, I made so many connections and that just shows like the connection between mental health and education, it's, it's all intertwined. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I just, can, I, can, I, can I add to that yeah, a little absolutely. bit too? Uh, and, and the great thing about, the one thing that's interesting about, especially with kids, as, as school-age kids, the mental health system and the school system kind of work in tandem because the school system is actually the biggest referral source for us, right? So if there's already a disconnect in how um, behaviors and, and expressing this is being interpreted in schools, it's we're already coming at a deficit, you know, and how, and how are we gonna be delivering uh, services that are responsive? And it's not always, it doesn't always have to be talk therapy. Yep. Not everybody needs to talk. Right? Maybe it's not even been a therapist. Maybe it's uh, maybe a person needs a mentor. There's a lot of um, studies out there that point out the power in mentorship. Right? Taking mm -hmm. folks that you know similar lived experiences and just connecting. Right? Um, so when we think of mental health. It's got we got to get to expand it beyond this kind of like sitting in a room talking, unloading your problems. Yeah. It's meditation. It's mindfulness. It's like it's going for a walk, right? It's how do you integrate and acknowledge all of that as part of mental wellness, right? If that kid is pissed off in school, maybe that kid needs to go for a walk and it should mm -hmm. be allowed because maybe they're in a charter school that is so rigid. And, you know, you know, charter schools are a lot of them are tied to corporations that aren't really thinking oh, yeah. about expressiveness of folks, right? So why not? Maybe the kid just needs to walk. I get upset sometimes. Maybe I just need to step outside, get a little fresh air. Then I'm back. Just want to throw it out there. Yeah, and and what you said about um like the label, like you you I mean when you guys get the referrals from the school, it must have this sheet long thing of this kid doesn't listen, he doesn't do this. That happens also grade to grade. So remember, these kids have it's a school the culture in our in the school buildings is like oh you're getting this kid oh he's so this, he's so that. And, you know, people can say all you want. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to, it's hard when, when you're, as a teacher, you're, you're, you're given this 25 page document saying all the things the kids can't do, all the things that, you know, it's, it's, we, we operate from a very deficit, deficit mindset of these students when, again, sometimes they just need a walk, but then people like to say, oh, well, they shouldn't get special treatment. To me, it's not special treatment because I can't even sit. I mean, right now I'm getting antsy. I'm like, oh my God. I, I imagine students sitting in a classroom in a subject that they're having a hard time in. They should be, it's, it's like a, it's, it's like their rights are not, it's not even having the right to go up and get, go, get, go for a walk, get a drink of water, get a snack, you know? So. Do you mind well, if you on this? Sure. Okay, so um, I've been working alongside a few different um, community organizations in New Bedford, um, New Bedford Save Our Schools and Breathe and a few other ones. And we've been having these conversations about how, you know, how can you be comfortable learning certain things in school when you don't even understand what you're learning because it has nothing to do with your culture. And then also, how can a teacher that doesn't even live in your area teach you when they don't even know your experiences? So those are just some of like some of the topics we've been really like talking about and SROs and stuff like that, but it, it's just so true. And I think you mentioned in the chat, Monique, um, about SROs and not to like get off topic, but um, a lot of these, like we were talking about like black masculinity and how they're viewed as like misbehavior, um, so much worse than a white student, you know, and when, and um, someone mentioned ADHD and something interesting I just read about ADHD is that so what presents in ADHD is often like, you know, fidgety, being fidgety, not being inattentive. A lot of times black boys will get mislabeled with the, um, um, emotional or behavioral disorders rather than ADHD. Um, ADHD is actually, I, oh God, I can't remember the paper, the, the, the author, but it was like, they called it a privilege disorder. 
and I never thought of it like that but it's kind of true it's like you know um it's like oh they have ADHD but a lot of other kids who are just fidgety and just need that sensory input or a break or something they get viewed as um as a behavior problem now where SROs are heavily placed are in in schools that have um that have a lot of um, black children and Hispanic children. And, you know, again, it's like this, this hyper focus on having to, to place surveillance on black boys. And then what happens to so many of them when they get older, they end up in prison. And it's like, we wonder why this happens it's because that, that's been their childhood is being in a, in a school where there's metal detectors and there's this and there's that. And, you know, they say it's about safety, but I mean, the white male is the most likely to be a school shooter, and yet that's not happening in those schools, you know? So I just wanted to throw that out there. I don't mean to get off subject. <laughs> no, absolutely no. Thank you, guys. This is great. I love hearing the dialogue back and forth. It's extremely important. Um, I'm going to get to um, a question here. Um, so it says, um, this is from Lisa. It says, why is that a person of color who suffers from depression, mental illness, commits suicide? And the first question is, um, was he in a gang or on drugs? Uh, a very close friend uh, committed suicide and was not in a gang or used drugs. He was overwhelmed with depression and feelings um, of family abandonment. Um, so would anyone um, like to take that, Kirby? Would you like to start with that? in real quick? Yeah, go ahead. So just because some of the work I've been doing um, with a Malcolm Gracia case, that's some of the first things even his teacher said was, well, he had mental illness, he wanted to die. Um, just a brief synopsis, this is a kid that was murdered by New Bedford Police Department. Um, but um, I think what I've noticed even on the news is when it's a black person, they automatically try to deteriorate your character no matter what the case is. When it's a white person, it's automatically, oh, you know, they were sick, they needed help. But when it's a black person, they, they try to demonize us and there's really no other answer for that, if you ask me. Ken, would you like to? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, I definitely echo everything she was saying, kind of the demonization of um, of Black and brown folks, people of color. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it goes with dehumanizing, but then demonizing, but also dehumanizing in the sense that um, our pain and our challenges, um, I feel, you know, I'll just say this, it goes back to kind of how, like even in slavery, when it comes to like, uh, like on the plantation, um, they use science to justify the behavior, how they would the treatment of us, right? So the studies on the plantations that would say, okay, studies show, the studies that we did show that black men can take more physical abuses, which then justified um, whippings, right? Black women are more fertile and can have babies. So then therefore it justifies our behavior. So it's like scientific racism. So that was the foundation of kind of how we utilize science to, um, negatively um, uh, step on, hold down black and brown folks, right, in this country. So now, now it's not just science now, right? We're using evidence-based models to, in, to be in these, in these communities that aren't, that aren't really good fit. But now the second end is the media and the narrative that is being portrayed, right? Um, you go, and I'm, I'm talking about criminal justice because like you mentioned earlier, criminal justice system has historically been the largest mental health uh, provider in this country. Back in the day, in the 90s, when they were talking about the super predators, the super predators look like me, right? Um, so then you got locked those super predators up. So that's the narrative. So when I have, so um, and um, so with uh, uh, Lamont's story of being pulled over and having that experience with law enforcement, it broke my heart to hear it, but it also didn't surprise me, right? Because of the narrative that's been played out around a black person in those situations. But then here's the other thing: it's our then there's, there's despite all this pain, people of color, black and people of color are resilient as ever. We've learned to adapt and survive. So I hear Lamont's story, Lamont is like, okay, I have, to, I have to, he has to process everything that's going on on the other end of that interaction because that's his responsibility because he, he needs to come out of that um, unscathed as possible, as safe as possible he can be. Why is that our responsibility as the person who's supposed to be served to protect? Protected. It's not because we're being served to protect, it's because we're supposed to be, we're hunted. We're hunted, whether physically we're hunted in the school system, we are hunted in, 
in every aspect of this of how this country is is, ma is managed, right? So that's my little rant. I'm done. I'll step back for a little bit. I don't take up too much time. Thank you, guys. Nice. Can I say something about that? Oh yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I actually just posted something about this today because I think the things that we're talking about here, these are all tools of the oppressor, right? And this is nothing new. It's just manifesting itself in different ways, right? So, for example, Birth of a Nation was revered as one of the greatest movies of all time. This it is a it is a living, breathing propaganda film about how the confused, poor, black, aggressive male could never be free, could never manage their own life, right? And it manifests itself today, right? Jonathan Manningly, one of the murderers of Breonna Taylor, was interviewed on Good Morning America by Michael Strahan and had the audacity to bring up George Floyd and say, well, he may have died, it may have been an overdose, I don't know. Um, and he wasn't, you know, an outstanding citizen either, right? And I think you can subtly say, okay, well, <laughs> he's justifying that he deserved to die because he was in that situation. But I think there's two levels to that, right? One of the tools of the oppressor is to villainize the victim, right? So George Floyd was on drugs. Maybe he was, um, you know, under the influence. That first autopsy said that that was the cause of death, and Guess who initiated that autopsy? The, the um, State Department, right? Who are working with the police, who are working with the Attorney General, right? Then a few days later, there's another autopsy by a separate um, entity that says that he died from asphyxiation, right? Now, um, I think it was New York Post, when it was deemed he was on drugs, the photo that they showed was this peaceful image of a vigil in his name. Days later, when it was deemed that he was murdered, the photo that they showed was him with a scowl on his face, right? Looking like that angry thug that we've come to know the black male to be, right? But if you look at the photo, you can see he's actually in a community center wearing a badge, volunteering and or doing work for the community, right? So they, not only do they villainize the victim, but they also turn the oppressor into the victim, right? Literally in that interview, he said, my, my, you know, I don't wanna put this on me, but I'm also a victim here. My family has gone into hiding for seven months. And again, villainizing uh, the victim and making the oppressor the, the, the victim themselves, these are tools that are consistently being propagated over and over again. And it's so easy to say, well, this was back in slavery or this was back in the, the, um, the civil rights movement, but they're all happening in the same exact way. The system is functioning exactly the way it was designed, right? It's meant to, I mean, statistically, um, sociologically, your, your success, your income in life isn't based off your, or isn't based off of you and your actions. It's based off what your father's career was, right? Like that's the most determining factor. So if we can keep this system of your father or your parents or whatever it is in this con constant system of poverty, it keeps the people who have it where they are and the people who don't where they are. And that, that's how it's functioning. But helping people recognize that propaganda when they hear it is the struggle, right? And I think it's easy to say that it was different back in slavery, but we now have droves of people, even politically, whose campaigns are built off of hate, who are built off of propaganda. So there's just so many tools and strategies that have worked for generations. Even going back to the, run the genocide in, in Rwanda, right? That's putting two groups of black people, the Hutu and the Tutsi against each other because one's tall and slender and one's dark and chubbier. And they are then literally killing each other. So it's, again, this black on black violence. You don't hear white on white violence, right? You don't hear Latinx on Latinx violence. It's all these things. And I even had this conversation with my mother when she's telling me about, oh, well, they just gotta get a couple of the bad cops. And I had to explain to her mom, it's not the bad cops, it's the system that allows you to be bad, right? Derek Chauvin had 17 complaints, 17 misconduct complaints. If I have two, I'm gone. <laughs> and I don't carry a gun at work, right? But again, when you have these systems that are meant for the people to believe this narrative, it gives, the policyholders and the attorneys and the courts, the ability to carry out these narratives where you have a woman who was murdered with the most clear cut case, but because there's no footage, 
we're hearing all these different stories and accounts of what actually happened. We wouldn't know who George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery were if there were no footage. We wouldn't know who Breonna Taylor was if there hadn't been George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery. It's just, I get so frustrated because I think that people have good intentions, but so much of imperialism uh, is based off of differences, right? Highlighting our differences allows us to say, well, I don't have that same experience, so this doesn't affect me. And we take that to how we go to the polls, right? If I'm a white, wealthy person who's not affected by the plights that George Floyd had, and, and his experience is so different from mine, it's very easy for me to turn a blind eye and lose my humanity. And that, that piece of humanity is something that when I have conversations with people, I, I try and push out of them, right? Because when it comes to black people, people of color, people with disabilities, people of different genders, it's very easy to separate them. When it comes to white people, we can lump them all together, right? Like people will generally say the Holocaust was a bad, bad thing. That was an atrocity that shouldn't have happened. When we talk about slavery, it was this necessity. We have congressmen who were saying slavery was a necessity, right? And the way I'm trying to try to position it to people is, is giving them a real life example that hopefully in my experience has helped them resonate with them. You know, I don't, it's not that I don't like Jewish people. I don't have a problem with Jewish people at all, but that Hitler's doing some great things for our economy. We can all hear that and think that's crazy, right? But you have people saying those same things today regarding politicians and policies that are put in place. People are literally being murdered and killed and disappearing. And, and it, it's, I, I just think to 50 years from now, what the history books will write about what's happening today, right? And it's so easy for us to say that the past was bad, but it's not like that now. It's, it's, things haven't changed. They just manifest and develop and evolve in different ways. And I think that's where I get apprehensive and anxious. But I think that we, what we've seen is that if our ancestors were able to start revolutions with pitchforks and nothing, we have more than a million and enough tools to do it now. And I'm having so many conversations with black people and, and Latin people as well who are saying, I can't do anything, my vote doesn't matter. <laughs> We're more empowered and have more resources than we've ever had. But there's, there's a lot, there's so many layers to it. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to speak for so long. I appreciate you all hosting this, but uh, that, that's all I got. No, thank you for that. that that's extremely powerful and it was, it was spot on. Um, and then thank you for going through that um, as well. And, you know, the, the biggest thing when, when we're having these conversations is that, right, is, is really looking at how do we influence and how do we make that change? And this is why these type of forms are created is kind of how do we, you know, again, we do have so much more at our, at our hands that we can that we can operate with, but we just don't, we just don't recognize where's the coordination. And this is why forms like this is, is extremely important to, to coordinate and to really, um, you know, get the community speaking on how can we make that change? Because again, I'm reading in the, the chat, people are saying they're sick and tired of this is not good enough. And, and all we do is we, we speak about these things and we're, there's nothing in action. And we all can see it, right? Because as soon as some, something is, uh, momentum is happening, and we have a conversation on, um, you know, like my George Floyd first form. I mean, we were here for four hours. I mean, hundreds of people signed up for it. Everybody was ready to, to create action and do things. And I know life is busy and a lot of things happen, but we were feeling it in that moment. And since then, um, it's died down a little bit. I'm not getting the emails I, I once received. I'm not getting, you know, the attendance is still decent, but it's not where it was there, you know? Um, and and that, a lot of things happen in life, but we tend to forget and not really continue pushing forward. And um, so thank you for that. We really need to continue pushing forward. This is, you know, why we create um, these spaces and hopefully, um, you know, we can help in our influence our little areas. It's, it's really exponential growth that we're looking for in, in order to do this and speak on many of these topics and watch how they all intersect and not forget about others as we are as we are, we're pushing forward. Um, I do have one question and then we, um, we are getting close to that time. So um, it, this one was for, um, I thought I'd just uh, throw it over you, to you, Julie. It asks, um, what, what is ableism? So someone was a little, um, wanted to kind of see if you can define that a little bit. And before we kind of wrap it up, I wanted to, to, to hit that. 
Definitely. So we think of racism as re that we're talking about in terms of discrimination based on the color of one's skin or racial identity, but ableism is discrimination based on one's ability. So what's essential is that we provide individuals with disabilities, their legally mandated civil rights to access, as Lamont has mentioned, and we can do that through universal design and accommodations. We can't create an undue burden though on the individual with the disability and we must provide them with an equitable experience. And we talk about that a lot with our equity inclusion mindsets. Oh, absolutely, thank you so much for that, Julie. Um, and I have one more um, question, let me just find it. So it was a general question. And again, this chat is great because it's moving. So let me just find my spot again. Um, it says, how can we come together? Um, and I kind of spoke a little about it. Because how can we come together to end a lot of this negativity and oppression that we are facing? So that's a general question that just in the inbox. Anybody has a solution or want to take a stab at it? Can I take a stab at that? Um, I think it's, I think that I, I, I have grown to hate the word negativity. Um, because I think that sometimes what we talk about might be viewed to others as negative. I'm so often called a negative person when I'm speaking about something that has to do with someone's rights or, some, or something related to justice. And um, I, think, I think it's important to recognize that is, is it negativity or is it just we're pointing out an, an injustice? And if that is what it is, then I think the question then turns into how can we um, get liberation and, and equity for whatever whatever that area is. So you know, um, if we're if we're talking about uh, like like my my discussion about um, you know black students being overrepresented. So you know, um, me pointing out race and in, in, in disability in my in my own profession, I've been viewed as somebody who's always always talk always bring race into everything and being negative and it's like well maybe if we just had like some sort of system in place where we can like um you know give give teachers pd on this and talk about it openly and not get so triggered maybe we can um maybe we can solve that problem a little bit better than just avoiding what we perceive as negativity because when we avoid it that's um that's causing even more harm do you know what i'm saying yeah, no, absolutely. Anybody else want to add in? Um, so I think in order to create change, we have to realize there's a lot that's not broken, but built against us. And we have to kind of come together. Not We need to like stop worrying about our differences so much and come together and kind of say, okay, we need to come up with a plan, like a legit plan. We can't just say, this is what we want. We need to have these conversations, make things uncomfortable, sit down with one another and come up with a game plan. We need to change policies. We need to dismantle the system. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll say something. Um, my, <clears throat> I was talking with a colleague of mine about this, you know, cause obviously everyone's thinking about social justice and making changes. Um, he described this as this is not just gonna be conversations. This is almost like, long-term invasive surgery and we're going to come out of it at times in pain we're going to stumble um it is an it is an invasive procedure what we're going to be going through if we're going to really be um thoughtful about this and we're going to we're going to mess up we're going to say things that we don't uh we we may not should be saying and we need to be able to call people in because if the purpose of this process is to get us all kind of um, seeing the same thing, seeing this differently, we've got to allow that imperfection, right? And so instead of calling folks out, it's about calling people in, like, hey, that wasn't great. How about um, not canceling folks, right? Like, this is like finding that space of this is surgery and it's going to be painful because it's but 400 years plus years of undoing. So it's not hiring a diversity of equity and inclusion position. It's not doing a couple of restorative circles for staff. It's not all, those things are important, but there's also this other stuff. It's certain executive directors of programs and agencies need to step down. 
right? Look at your board. Who's on your board? What is your values as an organization doing work, doing this work? Uh, so that's my thoughts and I'll step back again. No, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Um, so again, we want to be you know cautious of everyone's time, and we appreciate what's going on. If uh, so, um, again, when doing these um, forms, this is just the beginning conversation. And just keep in mind that it doesn't end here. What we're going to be doing is moving forward, um, especially next semester, where we will carry on to these type of forms and be very specific um, to you know any of the social justice. Um, or injustices that are out there or any of the topics or areas that we need to speak about. As you can see, we can continue going on and on and on. There's a lot of questions and comments in the comment section um, and it's really hard. We're not gonna, salute, we're not gonna solve anything tonight, um, but it's great to have that uncomfortable conversation and then have that and have professionals on here who deal with it on a daily basis to, to talk about what they see and for us to kind of really take it back to our area. So whether you're an educator um, in, in a classroom um, you can bring it back there. If you're just a parent and you want to bring it back to your home, you can do that. If you're, you know, a, a public servant uh, in a different industry, you can bring it there as well. And that's really the, the sole purpose of what we're doing here is to try to create that change little by little. And we will continue this work as we're moving forward. And what I'm, uh, what's a great part of this is um, we're about to share next is what our actionable items. So every um, time we have these forms and one thing that I've really wanted to focus on is talk about actionable items and areas where you can kind of get education um, and, and little, little pointers to kind of help you. More reading, um, access to um, links, access to different books, videos, things that really kind of get you um, a little bit more ingrained in, into, the, um, into the conversation. So um, we're gonna start with actionable items and the first person I believe is Julie, right? So Julie, would you please explain some of this, um, some of the things that you have for us? Absolutely, I'm attempting to pull together different um, pieces that talk about intersectionality around disability, um, different identities, racial identities, but also um, shares the social justice perspective or the social model on disability. We traditionally um, think about more of a medical model in our, our country, We're focusing on what is wrong with someone and how to cure them, as opposed to what's wrong with our environment or a society and what limitations um, or barriers are we creating for someone and how do we pull those barriers out and create access. So um, hopefully you'll enjoy looking through these resources. Thank you so much, Julie. And as you can see there, there was a, um, a ton of uh, links and things that you will receive. Uh, tomorrow, you will receive a, um, a newsletter from us that will give you access to these links and other, and uh, as well as the PowerPoint that we had today. Uh, next is uh, Kenton. Famous Realize I was still muted. Um, so here's a couple of resources I put up here. A um, couple of books, a couple of uh, um, reports. One I really want to highlight is the one first one, how to support male survivors of violence, the five year initiative. Um, this was a cohort of folks that were programs across the country, about 12 that were funded by the federal government um, to provide um, innovative services to boys and young men of color, specifically around trauma survivors. So um, projects were all over the country from Kansas City, Missouri to Boston, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, my program in Brooklyn. Um, and and they all they all provided services in very like unique, um, innovative ways. It wasn't just all about therapy. Um, a really great book I put here, uh, two books, Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Balanced Compassion. It's written by a man, uh, uh, Father Greg Boyle out in California. He started Homeboy Industries. Uh, it's an amazing book. And then there's Wrong Place, Wrong Time by Dr. John Rich, who runs a, a program in, a, in Philadelphia called Healing Her People, a violence prevention program working with young, young, young survivors of uh, gun violence. And they actually train those folks to, after the survivors of gun violence, they then train them to be um, community navigators, engaging with folks who are um, closest to the issue of gun violence. And their services are billable to insurance as preventive, as preventive, as preventive services. So these guys, then can now get a job and have like a service that is billable by insurance. Um, and there's some other good stuff there and there's a podcast. So that's it so far. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. And then the next uh, area, this is uh, 
for Sarah. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, so um, one of my things I, I wanted to point out is that um, a lot of, I don't think I mentioned this at all my, when I was speaking, but um, there's a lot of organizations that um, support people with disabilities and they're run by able-bodied people. So somebody asked what ableism is. I mean, this is kind of, you know, um, this is an example of it, it, it you know, kind of, people running these organizations who are able-bodied and there's no representation of the disability community. Even further, there's no representation of uh, people of color who are also disabled. So I wanted to point that out um, and just to kind of ask yourself, like, are they trying to just like cure them? Because I, one, one example, which some of you might know I'm, I'm referring to is like, there's been a lot of controversy with like, Autism Speaks. Um, you know, just so be mindful because sometimes it feels good when we give to organizations. We're like, oh, I'm going to get to this disability or organization, and you should look into whatever organization that is. Would it be more beneficial that maybe you gave to a program at a community college that's helping? You know, something that you know that your money is going to go directly to the person who um, who you're you're trying to help. Um, and I also had is there another slide because I also had books that I included. Oh, yep, there it is. Um, so um, I, and I spoke at the educational equity one, so I didn't want to like be redundant and include all those books. But um, there's, these books are like, in my opinion, just amazing, and will open your eyes. Um, Discrit, it's, it's, it's more of like a theory, I have it right here, actually. It's more like a theory book, but like, I, I would challenge everyone to kind of like, at least pick like, two of these books and try to read it this year, like, you know, um, and, and again, like someone had asked, like, what is ableism? So many of us don't know what it is. And that's not absolutely not anyone's fault. But just like how white people need to explore how they play a part in racism, we all who are able bodied neurotypical, and even if you even if you are part of the disability community, it's important to, to realize you, you hold certain privileges. So you know, you might not be neurotypical, but you might be, um, you might have mobility privilege. And it's important to recognize these privileges we have. And just again, one of the books, I think I know, I noted there, Care Work. She talks so much about community care. Our country has like no community care. Nobody cares about each other. <laughs> like, like after I read, I started that book, I was like, wow, like we really just exclude people. And it's not just based on race. It's like, based on ability as well and 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 make and put so many barriers in place for them to just get just to, to be able to go to the grocery store or to be able to go to whatever because of our privilege so i think it's important that we all explore that just like we're all exploring white privilege we need to explore able-bodied privilege as well thank you so much for that so as we're wrapping up um we're already down to our last um, so, you know, as we, we've gone through in July, we did the police criminal justice, um, and also we did the race and educational inequity. In August, we did the race and women's rights. September, we did the race and LGBTQ rights. October, we're right now at the race, disability, and mental health rights. So our last one is on November 19th, and we would love for you to participate, tell your friends and family, uh, race and immigrant rights, okay? Um, and again, we're going to speak about in some intersection now, inter, some intersections um, within the communities and some of the um, oppressive things that are happening to some of our immigrants. And we're and we will have two community members of um, Bristol Community College that will be moderating. It won't be me that will moderate, um, which will be Livia Newber and Carlos Almeida, who are professionals here at Bristol and work with our um, immigrant and our um, international. Uh, populations um, here at Bristol. Um, again, this, you know, I, I want to thank everybody for being here. Next slide, please. As you can, you can always connect with us as well, um, you know, through email, connect with us you know, through our website, which has a lot of information. We will be sending out our newsletter, which will have tons and tons of little information and, and the links that our panel shared with you in order to um, you know, keep you up to date with things that are happening. What's great about influencing our circles and my charging goal is we will continuously always add to this. 
these conversations don't end. It doesn't just stop here with a conversation and we're like, all right, we feel good about ourselves. No, we wanna make sure that we continue this work. Look out for next semester. Um, right now, the plan and the structuring of it will be more, we'll still have these forms, but they're gonna start turning into workshops. So it'll be where we have breakout rooms, we have discussions where people are being, who are moderating uh, specific breakout rooms and really diving into some of these topics that we had spoke about. Um, what we have spoke about prior are really the foundational groundwork, the uncomfortable conversation to kind of get it up, um, get it out there. And then we're gonna start creating some of these workshops where we have various professionals who will lead them um, and as well as myself, my department and others within our school, our local community and throughout the country. Um, we're looking to bring people in to really dive in and work on that. Um, also, please, you know, Follow us on Twitter at Bristol MSC on Twitter. Um, you can, um, our Instagram page is also there and our Facebook page um, is, is also listed. Um, and again, I wanna thank everybody for, for being here. I know we're a couple of minutes over uh, the six o'clock deadline, but again, 42 of us stay, stayed on, stay strong. I appreciate a lot of the students who are involved. Um, I wanna thank uh, Melissa for, um, again, keeping us organized and doing what you do um, behind the scenes. I want to thank Kenton, Julie, Sarah, Monique, and also not, not least um, Lamont for um, being part of our, our panel today and sharing uh, your experiences. You guys are valuable to the community. I want you to continue doing what you're doing. Um, and if you guys need us, you know where we are. Um, appreciate you and everyone have a, a great night and I'll see you on November 19th.